I'm Lisa Martin from Hariba Veterinary and I'm delighted to welcome you to our next Continuing Professional Development webinar. Our previous content can be found on the Hariba Veterinary website in the support section. The address for this is displayed on your screen now. I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, tell you a little bit about what to expect from the webinar and about Hariba Veterinary. We're very pleased to be working with Kit Sturgis, a highly experienced practicing veterinary surgeon. Kit graduated from Cambridge University in 1986 and then spent six years in general veterinary practice. He's gained further professional qualifications in imaging, cardiology and internal medicine and was awarded a PhD for looking at the effects of FIV on mucosal immune function. Kit is a fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, a specialist in small animal internal medicine and an advanced practitioner in veterinary cardiology. Kit's been seeing referral small animal medicine cases for the last 30 years, both at university-based and private specialist practices. Kit's love of teaching and learning has led him to develop a flexible role, combining lecturing, writing, volunteering, and about 40% of his time in clinics seeing referral medicine and cardiology cases. Kit is Chair of Trustees at Cats Protection and Editor-in-Chief of Veterinary Evidence, publishing content relating to evidence-based veterinary medicine and its application in veterinary practice. Kit maintains a keen interest in many areas of internal medicine and has authored numerous articles and two textbooks, as well as presenting at lectures and research abstracts at conferences worldwide. One of the biggest challenges for a clinician is being presented with a patient that is unwell, trying to decide what the disease process might be and how urgent achieving a diagnosis is. This webinar aims to help in the decision around when to wait and when to worry by discussing how you can help give direction at an affordable cost to the owner. Hariba Veterinary are part of Hariba Medical, a well-established provider of laboratory diagnostic instruments for animals and people too. Hariba Veterinary work with reference laboratories, educational settings and general and referral veterinary practices. We have a wide product range including handheld meters running a single parameter. We have high capacity automated systems and the first fully integrated in-house PCR testing system. Here's a brief introduction to the range. Our Laqua Twin handheld meters work in seconds including metabolites and electrolytes and can be used patient side. Hariba offer two systems for clinical chemistry testing. Our Pentra PC400 is a high throughput wet chemistry analyzer most suited to larger practices and reference laboratories. It features capacity for 55 onboard assays for day-to-day -day testing and beyond, including electrolytes, inflammatory markers and acute phase proteins. Users can run a single parameter or create their own fully bespoke profiles, including the use of open channels. The 120 VP analyzer works in minutes on whole blood samples with 15 predefined panels available for comprehensive or targeted testing in all species. Up to 24 parameters are simultaneously reported. Specific concerns can be addressed and monitored including diabetes, electrolyte balance, liver and kidney function, with additional profiles for coagulation and inflammation including canine CRP and feline SAA. The Pocket Central PCR analyzer is a fast, compact benchtop instrument. All steps of the PCR process are fully automated and do not require any additional specialist equipment. It can be run by any trained member of the practice team 24 hours a day. Results are reported in just 85 minutes with no waiting for a lab pickup or for your results to be sent back through. Speeding up diagnosis times and aiding in your patient management. The Pocket Central test range includes over 190 assays incorporating bacteria, viruses, parasites and protozoa across small animal, farm, equine, poultry and aquaculture work. The Pocket Central enables fast and easy PCR testing in any practice. Should you have any questions for Kit or for the Hariba team, 
please write your query into the Q&A box on your screen and we'll cover as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. If you would like Hariba to issue you with a certificate of attendance, please also put your name and email address into the Q&A box and it'll be sent on in the next few days. You'll also have our contact details at the end of the webinar for any later queries or if you're watching back. The event recording will be available to view shortly via the Hariba Veterinary website and you'll be sent details of how to access it for yourself or for any interested colleagues. So now I'd like to hand over to Kit Sturgis to talk to us about getting the most from your practice laboratory, the diagnosis of inflammatory disease, including pancreatitis in cats and dogs. Thank you, Lisa, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all tonight and talking, <coughs> excuse me, about one of my favourite subjects, which is inflammatory markers in cats and dogs and how they can help us with diagnosis. I think the veterinary profession is lagging a little bit behind the medics in this respect, and in many um, hospital situations, CRP is a standard part of a a comprehensive profile when running biochemistry and I suspect over the coming years it will become so for veterinary patients as well. So um, I am just having trouble uh, changing. Oh, right. um, so just before we get going, declarations of interest, as Lisa's kindly said, I'm Chair of Trustees at Cats Protection and Editor-in-Chief of Veterinary Evidence. I do some work for the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and the, this webinar is being funded by Hariba, but I don't have any specific um, funds relating to acute phase proteins. So, as Lisa mentioned in the introduction, one of the biggest challenges in veterinary practice is when you're presented with a patient that is vaguely unwell and you need to decide whether this is likely to be a self-limiting process that some time will resolve, or whether this is something that is more sick and hiding it well and requires um, an urgent diagnosis. So really, as mentioned, when you should wait because that's the right thing to do and when you should worry and um, talk to the owner about being more proactive in terms of diagnosis. And when we see these cases, when we feel there are indications that we should be a bit more interactive then can we do this with it with our in-house laboratory because that certainly speeds up um, the process we don't have to send samples out we don't have to wait for results i see a lot of referral cases where somewhere in the notes there's a diagnosis of pancreatitis that's being made and that's a typical example of an inflammatory disease and it can present in a huge variety of forms from acutely sick and sometimes sadly um, really um, poor prognosis but far more commonly they're the chronic grumbling disease. The problem we face is that um, both um, canine pancreatic lipase and pancreatic specific lipase or DGGR lipase are often elevated in sick patients and we're really faced with the question of is that a genuine elevation reflecting pancreatic disease? If it is, is the pancreatitis the primary problem and we can make that as a diagnosis um, and move on towards treatment? Or has the pancreatitis occurred secondary to another problem? So just today, for example, um, we had a, a dog sadly develop acute kidney injury following an anaesthetic and this dog's uh, pancreatic parameters are up. Um, and then, the, so the question is, how relevant is that to our current management for a dog that's not eating and feeling very nauseated? <clears throat> so just to recap, what is inflammation? And inflammation is well illustrated in the cartoon on the right, it's heat, redness, swelling, pain, loss of function. But it's actually a quite a complex biological response um, 
when body tissue is harmed by pathogens, um, cells or irritants, damaged cells or irritants, and this can include internal processes such as neoplasia. It is a protective and reparative response that involves the immune system, the blood vessels, obviously, and molecular mediators, including cytokines, interleukins, 6, for example, is particularly important. And the purpose of inflammation is to eliminate the initial cause of cell injury, get rid of all any necrotic dead and dying cells, and in the damaged and damaged tissue and then start the repair process so although we see inflammation as being a concern and something we need to treat it does have a very important biological process and so it's more a reflection that something is going on within the tissues than a problem of itself in many instances We really see two types of inflammation. We see localized inflammation in a single organ, and we see systemic inflammation in animals and patients that are more um, generally unwell. I'm not going to talk much in this presentation about acute systemic inflammation, because that's a very rapid emergency situation where it's going to be quite clear that the patient is really sick. Um, the they develop a really pro-inflammatory response, which results in a systemic inflammatory response syndrome with um, endothelial dysfunction. Your platelets start sludging, you start forming clots, um, the coagulation system is activated, and you start getting fluid maldistribution. And this leads to systemic shock. And if you don't get on top of that very quickly, then sadly, you'll end up with a patient that's going to die. What I want to focus on a bit more is, is more of a chronic systemic inflammation. And by chronic, that can be still a relatively short period of time over a couple of days, or <coughs> it can even be over a much longer period of time, maybe a few months. And these, this chronic systemic inflammation is the result of the release of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines from immune cells that are being activated which then leads to activation of the innate immune system. And when we talk about chronic systemic inflammation, um, we're really looking at three big groups of diseases, although there are a few other things that will cause um, systemic inflammation. But, but often when we're faced with a patient with systemic inflammation, what we're trying to decide is, is there an infection somewhere? So could this be uh, a migrating foreign body, for example, or could this be um, a viral or bacterial infection? Is the inflammation a reflection of immune-mediated disease? So is the primary concern that we face an immune system that's going wrong, or is this a paraneoplastic syndrome and the immune system is being activated by the neoplastic cells themselves, which sometimes will release cytokines or induce an immune response, <coughs> or sometimes necrosis of the tumour will lead to systemic inflammation. And that's a really important group of conditions that we need to try and sift through. But often in the first instance, it's recognising that there is systemic inflammation that's critical. So one of the responses to systemic inflammation is the release of acute phase proteins. And we see two types of acute phase proteins. We see positive acute phase proteins. The levels of these proteins increase in the blood with inflammation. And most acute phase proteins are primarily produced by hepatocytes. On the right hand side, you can see two um, serum protein electrophoresis tests, which look at the various subsections of the protein peak. So the big pro peak in red is albumin, and then we have alpha-1, alpha-2, the beta peaks, and then gamma globulins, which are our antibodies. And this is <clears throat> from a dog with uveitis, which I see a fair number of these cases um, referred because we're trying to decide if um, this is a systemic inflammatory response with secondary uveitis, 
or whether it's primarily ocular disease. And the serum protein electrophoresis in this dog is normal, and the CRP was unmeasurably low, less than 10. Comparing this to the dog below, this was a 20-month-old sheepadoodle that came with just vague signs of not being quite right, being slow to rise, a bit more lethargic on walks, a little bit of weight loss, um, a bit of stiffness, um, and a bit of inappetence. So nothing that shines really bad disease, but something that you, a typical case where you're really trying to decide, do I just give more time or do I investigate? And we can see that the total protein is increased in this patient, but we have this really big rise in our beta and gamma peak. So this is a, there's a, an antibody response, but also there's an acute phase protein response. And when we measured CRP in this patient, it was 94, which is quite significantly elevated. So in this particular assay, and it does vary between labs and between assays, we would consider the reference interval to be less than 10, 10 to 20 to be equivocal, and over 20 to be evidence of systemic inflammation. So this CRP is reflected in the elevations in, in the beta peak. So typically in dogs, we measure C-reactive protein. It's a well-established assay, very useful assay. Um, unfortunately, cats being cats, it doesn't work effectively in cats. And we've looked at a number of other inflammatory acute phase proteins, such as haptoglobin, serum amyloid A, and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. And as Lisa mentioned in her introduction, one of the assays that um, the machines that Hariba produce can, can analyze is serum amyloid A. There are also some negative acute phase proteins, such as albumin and transferrin. So you may well see in acutely inflamed patient that they actually have a slightly low albumin. Um, and you can see in this dog on the bottom had an albumin concentration of 22.2, which is below our reference interval, whereas the dog at the top here whose um, uh, albumin is um, within, well within the reference range. So when you see a low albumin, don't necessarily immediately think about a protein losing enteropathy or nephropathy or um, liver failure, but this may be a reflection of systemic inflammation and um, albumin being shown up as a negative acute phase protein. So for uh, the first little bit of this talk, I wanted to talk about CRP. I know some of you will be quite familiar with it. I know some of you will be using it already, but just really to show you a few cases where I found it very useful um, and, and talk a little bit about um, the, the protein itself. So it's produced in the liver and it has a whole range of activities on various immune cells. Um, interestingly, I think we're understanding more and more that um, fat cells also have some roles in inflammation. Um, and so they are also a part of the inflammatory process, which we perhaps haven't appreciated before. So the role of CERP is to bind factors expressed on the surface of dead and dying cells and activate complement to cause those cells to be removed, phagocytosed and removed. It's synthesized in the liver and one and released by the adipocytes. So again, showing the importance of fat cells in the inflammatory process. And interleukin-6 is a major driver of the production of CRP, but other things as well. Interestingly, cortisol will drive the C-reactive protein production in the early stages. One of the advantages of CRP is it rises quite rapidly. So within four hours of systemic inflammation, you'll start to see CRP rising. So it's quite a sensitive early marker of inflammation. And its half-life isn't that long. So within 36 to 48 hours, if that inflammation has been resolved, then the levels of CRP will drop quite dramatically. There is some confusion in some um, people's minds and in some literature sometime of other C proteins. So there's C peptide, which is part of proinsulin, 
and there's protein C, which is used in the regulation of blood clotting, and there are a few papers about the measurement of protein C in some disease states. Um, for example, people have used protein C as a marker of um, uh, microvascular dysplasia in the liver of, of dogs. So just to make that very clear, we're not talking either about C peptide or protein C. So CRP does seem to be <coughs> a specific and sensitive marker of information. The only, the real downside to CRP is it, it's non-specific. So it doesn't tell us what that inflammation is, whether it's infection, whether it's immune mediated, whether it's neoplasia, nor does it tell us um, where the driver of that inflammation may be occurring. But what it does tell us is that that inflammation is to the point where it's affecting the whole body. So it's not just a, a localized inflammation. So when we look at uveitis, for example, where it's, where it's ocular only, then although there is quite intense inflammation sometimes in the eyes, CRP will be normal. Similarly, if you've got a walled off cat bite abscess, then um, you wouldn't expect the inflammatory markers to be increased. Um, there have been quite a lot of published studies and like any single parameter, there are some downsides we're trying to measure it. So there's quite a lot of variation between individuals. Um, and when people have looked at, is there a level of CRP that tells us something um, into both in terms of um, nor uh, patients within the reference interval and patients outside the reference interval, there is overlap, which is why most CRP um, reference intervals have a reference interval and then they have an equivocal range where some um, normal patients may sit. And people have also tried to use CRP in prognosticating. So for example, if you see a dog with immune mediated hemolytic anemia, then can we, um, measure CRP and say those dogs with very high CRP um, are um, have a worse prognosis but that again does not seem to be the case so there are things that CRP can't do for us there are a variety of ways of measuring um, CRP but typically it's either measured by an ELISA or immunoturbometric methods and as mentioned that the reference interval is very specific for the laboratory that you use so particularly if you're looking at serial CRP measurement, it's much better to use the same test methodology in the same lab because you, the results will be much more comparable. One of the things that's also very clear about CRP is it's significantly more sensitive and specific than white blood cell count. So there are all sorts of reasons why you might have a high white blood cell count and off sometimes a high neutrophil count. So it can just be a, a stress response to blood sampling. Um, we see probably more cases where the white cell count appears normal, but CRP is clearly abnormal. So we can't always rely on the white cell count to indicate to us that inf infection or inflammation is um, going on. We certainly can use it to look at um, response to therapy. And the other advantage is that it's pretty robust. It's a small protein. You can kind of be fairly um, mean to it and it still will be measurable. So it's less affected by hemolysis or freeze thawing than sort of typical um, hematologic par parameters. So for me at this point, until we perhaps know a bit more about it, we're using CRP to evaluate that sick patient, asking the question, is there systemic inflammation? Or sometimes, um, we know there's inflammation in an organ like the eye, and we're asking the question, is that a localized inflammation or is that part of a, a more extensive systemic inflammatory response? And there is also value in following response to treatment. So there have been cases, for example, where we've used CRP in um, patients with suspected migrating foreign bodies to try and, which we are unable to find, or we have found, but they're in a site where um, surgery would be quite high risk and we've looked at whether we can get those foreign bodies that migrating grass sea walled off and we've used CRP to give us some indication of how we're doing. Um, other things, um, for example, using CRP to discriminate between suppurative arthritis and osteoarthritis, 
that can be very useful. So you've got a lame dog and your question is, have we got an infectious arthritis or um, an immune-mediated polyarthritis or is this an old dog with degenerative joint disease? And certainly in my experience, dogs with IMPA, um, they will have some really quite high C-reactive protein levels, whereas your typical older dog with OA, the CRP will not be elevated because that inflammation is confined to the joint itself. So, um, just want to present some case examples. Um, so measuring CRP in the house can be really valuable because you're presented with that sick patient and you can get forward with, yes, it has got systemic inflammation. Yes, that suggests we do need to investigate it. Um, the ability of some external labs to measure <coughs> CRP is, is variable. So some labs don't aren't able to measure CRP themselves, so they send it out, which can sometimes cause um, quite a delay. So I wanted to introduce you to Munchie. Munchie is one of my um, special children. She, this was when she was 13 months old. She's now six years old, and she has a lot of challenges in her life, um, but she is actually an amazing international um, agility dog so she's like a tiny little fox when she gets going super fast super um, able but she presented um, with a four-day progressive history of GI signs lethargy weakness and inhabitants referring vets had done some investigations um, and they found she was mildly feverish she was a bit pale um, they'd run hematology biochemistry and done some chest x-rays and abdominal x-rays so this was her haematology. Um, red cell count was normal and white cell count was also within the reference range. She had a mildly elevated particular site count, which as a single parameter is difficult to benchmark. Some dogs will push reticular sites out of their spleen when they're stressed. So this can be just a response to sampling. Biochemistry showed a mild increase in globulins, which is interesting. Um, difficult to know what that means, um, but it was certainly outside the reference range. Although just really important to remember that none of the biochemical machines used measure globulin. Globulin is, is a derived parameter. So total protein is measured, albumin is measured, and then globulin is subtraction of albumin from total protein. So if for any reason albumin is mismeasured, that will also give you an an unreliable globulin result. But it's interesting in this particular munchie that her total protein is quite high, but you can see the albumin is towards the lower end of the reference interval. The vets did take some radiographs. I think the things that strike you about this is that perhaps the serosal detail isn't quite as good as you might like, and there's poorly defined um, soft tissue in the caudal abdomen. So Munchie came in and we looked at her C-reactive protein and it was 136, so significantly elevated, suggestive of um, systemic inflammation. And that really then pushes me to say, well, I don't think we should wait in this patient. Um, and particularly with Munchie, some of you may have noticed uh, that she wears nappies and that's because she has um, a very cordially displaced bladder with a very wide um, urethra and, and she's chronically incontinent. Um, so she is at risk of, of, of ascending urinary infections. And my concern at the time was whether she had pyelonephritis or not. But actually, when we um, looked at her, she had some free granular abdominal fluid so when you see abdominal fluid that looks like this rather than a sort of black color that really um, makes you concerned that um, that there is uh, it's highly cellular so it could be blood or it could be um, white cells it could be an in an exudative um, peritonitis and she also had some dilated loops of her in her uterus so when we did abdominal synthesis large numbers of genetic neutrophils containing a mixed population of bacteria. So Munchie had a septic peritonitis. And I use Munchie as an example just because her white cell count looked really boring, but this dog has got really severe infectious disease. And 
sometimes you will get a normal white cell count. And, and that's because although production is upregulated, um, neutrophils are being sequestrated into the abdomen. So the net effect is apparently a, a white count and a neutrophil count within the reference interval. So, so Munchie went to surgery and she had um, a, a very hysterectomy and we flushed out her abdomen and she did really quite well. We can see that immediately post-surgery, her CRP hadn't fallen very much because we were just 24 hours from that and there was now some a certain level of surgical inflammation. But by day two, we could see quite a dramatic fall in her CRP, suggesting that everything was going well, that the peritonitis had been adequately managed with lavage and with the antimicrobials that she was on. So six weeks later, she recovered well and was back doing her agility work, but she was um, still significantly incontinent. And so the decision, I made the decision to try her with some estrogen therapy. Um, and um, she had a good response and had become dry. But then after eight days of therapy, the owners noticed that she was just not as well again. And we saw her and we can see that she Develop, was developing what appeared to be a stump pyometra and her C-reactive protein had started to go back up again. Now, this wasn't um, a failure of the surgery and, and as most of you know, I'm not allowed near sharp cutting things, so the surgery wasn't down to me, but she had had a number of operations to try and manage her incontinence, including um, corpus suspension, so it wasn't possible to dissect down to the um, cervix when her, she had her um, <clears throat> ovaria hysterectomy. So some um, over, uh, his, some uh, tissue was left and um, that seemed to be reacting to giving her estrogens. Next case um, is a nine-year-old schnauzer called Oliver who had fake emulsification of her cataracts the previous day. They had some difficulty maintaining his blood pressure during anesthesia and the following day he was quiet, depressed, anorexic and um, was known to have had a previous history of pancreatitis because he's a schnauzer and he'd read the good schnauzer handbook that pancreatitis is one of the things one, one gets if one's a schnauzer. So when we measured, um, did a SNAP um, pancreatic lipase, it gave us an equivocal result but his C-reactive protein was mildly elevated and abdominal ultrasound showed um, some mild chronic changes in the pancreas. So we can see the duodenum here and the pancreas sitting below looking somewhat mottled. So I guess I felt some level of confidence that this probably was um, a flare up of the pancreatitis, probably associated with hyperperfusion um, during his anaesthetic the previous day, but at this point not really severe um, and therefore fairly um, low-grade symptomatic and supportive treatment would be appropriate. Whereas if this was a much more fulminating pancreatitis, I would have expected a much higher C-reactive protein and we'll come and talk about the pancreatic lipase test a little bit later in this talk. So we decided to discharge him because he wasn't eating, but we felt that was a lot to do with um, the fact that he was um, didn't like being hospitalised and the only reported he recovered really quite quickly. Interestingly, when we submitted that equivocal um, pancreatic lipase on the SNAP test to the external lab, it came back showing quite significant increase. Um, Ollie was one of the cases that presented um, in the little teaser question, so I thought I'd go through with, with you, Ollie. 10-year-old male neutral germ short hair pointer belonging to our head nurse, and so I'm sure all of you are already thinking this is going to be something bizarre because that's what happens with nurses' um, dogs, and presented vaguely unwell. He was generally a pretty bouncy dog, but he was just off his game a bit, a bit stiff, um, slightly pottery, but he did have a history of chronic osteoarthritis, but had a, a reasonable fever and mild abdominal discomfort as well as um, reduced range of movement um, and pain in his elbows, which was um, thought to be due to his OA. Ran his haematology biochemistry, 
And again, nothing very exciting on his haematology. Um, lymphopenia was assumed to be due to a stress response and the low platelet count seemed to be because there was some clumping. We did urinalysis, which again wasn't um, very helpful, but um, we ran a CRP, which was vastly elevated. So again, that says to me, although this dog appears vaguely unwell, there's something pretty substantially inflammatory going on and we really need to follow that up, find out what's wrong. And my thought at the time was potentially that he had immune mediated polyarthritis and what we were looking at in terms of pain uh, with on joint manipulation in a patient with known osteoarthritis um, was actually more to do with a, a more of an inflammatory immune mediated arthritis rather than a chronic osteoarthritis. And that's something it come across frequently in my career, patients with known disease there's always a temptation when they show signs compatible with their known disease that we assume that's what's wrong and we don't necessarily investigate further. We did um, abdominal ultrasound and he had um, mildly enlarged um, abdominal lymph nodes, but it didn't really explain what we were seeing. And I took a decision to run um, a blood culture on him and it came back with streptococcus. So he had um, a, a systemic infection and he was septicemic. And um, so that was why he was apparently so inflammatory. That is important to know both in terms of how we would treat that, be much more aggressive with our choice of antimicrobials, um, give it intravenously, but also um, it tells me that there's some point at which these bacteria were getting into his body and that gives you cause for thought as to exactly what that might be. But I probably wouldn't have been so keen to investigate further and keen to do something quickly um, without the fact that CRP was raised and um, obviously in the presence of septicemia he would potentially be at risk of developing secondary problems like endocarditis for example. And just wanted to talk <coughs> about Molly, a seven-year-old Cocker Spaniel with severe uveitis. So we're talking, are we, are we talking systemic um, inflammation with secondary uveitis or primary ocular disease? But her CRP was 51, which suggested systemic inflammation. She did have a white cell response, so elevated neutrophils, a few bands, and monocytosis, so fairly typical of inflammation. Uh, albumin was a bit low, so that might be a negative acute phase response. Total calcium was a bit low um, because um, one assumed reduced binding to albumin, and that's where total calcium does have weaknesses. And we, we didn't in this patient run an ionized calcium, but if you were concerned, that would be the place to go. But evidence of significant um, inflammation within the liver and that seemed to be the point at which she was having problems. So um, this did appear to be a hepatitis with secondary um, uveitis. She also had some other changes and she had some big, uh, big adrenal glands we can see here. So this is the, the kidney and she had changes in one of the loops of her small intestine. We went ahead and did CT on her because we were unsure exactly what this all meant, but we can see a really abnormal um, image of her in, in bowel. And um, sadly, she turned out to have lymphoma um, and that was driving that CRP and driving her uveitis. So again, the although probably in the long term, it didn't affect her prognosis because she had an essentially uh, incurable disease. It did mean we got to that answer more quickly. We could support the owners better rather than just looking at a dog with uveitis and perhaps giving topical treatment or possibly even worse, not worse still, but more confusing if we'd given her systemic steroids, she may appear to have done very well in the short term, but in the longer term, 
that can make treatment with a chemotherapy for lymphoma less successful. So I think CRP, hopefully I've convinced you that CRP is definitely something that you can use very productively to manage your clinical cases, something that maybe you want to consider getting into your practice um, so you can measure them in-house and um, look at um, what cases they, they um, do well for. There are some people now developing high sensitivity CRP, and this is directed towards monitoring therapy in things like chemotherapy or cardiovascular disease. We're looking at it a little bit in immunosuppressive therapy. So that big question, when we, when we have a dog being given prednisolone to treat an inflammatory disease, an immune mediated disease like IMHA, when do we decide to reduce the prednisolone? At the moment, I think if you're like me, it's very kind of ad hoc. I was always, I give about three weeks and if the patient's doing well, then I reduce the dose. But I have no evidence that three weeks is the right time. So some patients I may be giving way more steroid than they need and they're getting more side effects. Other patients I may be reducing them too early and risk relapse. So this was a case where we used um, C high sensitive CRP and this was a dog with sterile granulomatous dermatitis and lymphadenitis. And she responded well to prednisolone and cyclosporine and the lesions almost entirely cleared up um, apart from her chin and her high sensitivity CRP was quite low. But when we got a flare up, we can see that her high sensitivity CRP started to rise and the more severe the flare up, the higher the high sensitivity was. So again, this tells us a little bit about the fact that this is clearly inflammatory, tells us a little bit about what we're trying to achieve with treatment and, and that reducing therapy in this dog was not, um, it wasn't possible because every time we did, she started to have a recurrence of inflammation. So we may have um, some value in, in um, using it as a, as a way of deciding on therapy. There are people who are looking at it too as a prognostic indicator. So I talked a lot about dogs and the natural question is, well, what about cats? Having an inflammatory marker for cats would be super useful because cats are, are much more secretive about their disease than dogs, which makes it harder to decide when you're presented with a quack cat that's quiet, a little bit off its food, a little bit lethargic. Is this cat significantly unwell? Has it got inflammatory disease or not? Unfortunately, as I mentioned, cats being cats, CRP doesn't work, but there are some other inflammatory markers that we'll, we can use. And the three that have been probably most widely used are haptoglobin, serum amyloid A, and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. Haptoglobin is, is an interesting marker. It, it, it is an inflammatory marker. Um, its main role is to scavenge hemoglobin. So the problem with it as using it as an inflammatory marker, particularly in cats, is if you get any hemolysis of your sample, you'll artificially lower the haptoglobin. So you need a very clean sample. You need to spin it down quickly so that you don't get any hemolysis. So it's a little bit fiddly as a marker. Serum amyloid A has many potential advantages. It's part of the apolipoprotein family. It's associated with HDL. Um, lipoproteins transporting cholesterol. It does have quite marked increases um, quite quickly, so it acts well as an acute phase response. It sits in the beta 2 peak, so you can actually see it on SPE when it's raised because it's a major component of that beta 2 peak. The other marker that we're using a bit is alpha 1 acid glycoprotein. Many of you will have perhaps used it when you're doing a screen for feline infectious peritonitis. I just wanted to put it in here because it does have some value, but really to emphasize that it is an acute phase protein. So there's nothing about it that's specific to feline infectious peritonitis. It's just telling you that your cat has a systemic inflammatory disease, which is what um, FIP is amongst other things. Currently, I think our understanding of acute phase proteins in cats is quite poor. Um, this was some work I did looking at haptoglobin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. And really, you can see that the relationship is 
quite poor. So they didn't seem to correlate. So there are cases where haptoglobin was quite markedly increased, but the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein was unremarkable. Other cases where alpha-1 acid glycoprotein was quite high, but the haptoglobin was within the reference interval. So this is a more complex situation in cats. And um, this is some work that's never been seen before. So you're the first group of people to see it. This is some work where I've looked at trying to compare all three of these inflammatory markers. And as you can see, um, really didn't, um, rarely correlated particularly well. So it may be that we need to use specific um, inflammatory proteins to look for specific things. The assay that I used for serum amyloid A really didn't seem to respond very well to inflammation, but it's really important to emphasize that not these acute phase protein markers are quite lab specific. And it may be that I just used a lab whose marker was really not that good at picking up serum amyloid A in cats. There was one case here in green that had all three inflammatory markers up, which is an elderly Burmese called Raja, who had a long history of weight loss and anorexia. And when you we ultrasounded him, he had um, septic peritonitis secondary to neoplasia. So again, um, like Munchie, that's a good a disease which will really drive up um, our acute phase proteins. And although you think, well, any septic peritonitis case must be really sick, my experience, particularly in cats, is they can have grumbling peritonitis for quite long periods and just be vaguely unwell. So this, again, is something that really alerts you to the fact that you need to get on and investigate the case. So I think there's a lot more to learn about acute phase proteins in cats, but I think it's definitely worth looking um, at learning more because I think it could be really useful in the way that we manage these cats because so many sick cats I see just arrive with fairly vague signs of um, just inappetence, lethargy, um, bit of weight loss. But I thought I'd talk to you about a couple of cases. Um, so this is Wish. She's a was when she presented a five-month-old ragdoll kitten. She came in to see the ophthalmologist because she had uveitis, um, but they were concerned about her being a young um, pedigree kitten, ran some bloods, and she had high total proteins and high globulin, mild to moderate anemia, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia. So those, the, the high protein and elevated globulins, mild anemia, lymphopenia, those are pretty classic non-specific hallmarks of FIP. So that's a real sort of red flag to me in terms of does this cat have feline infectious peritonitis. She had a really high coronavirus teta. Um, and although you cannot use coronavirus teta as a diagnostic tool, it again really supported the fact this young kitten had been exposed to coronavirus. So increased the index of suspicion that this was FIP. And um, measured alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and that was elevated to suggesting systemic inflammation. So again, although the only outward sign was uveitis, although when you looked at WISH globally, you felt she was a bit small and a bit scraggy for a, a five-month-old rag doll. The problem is that none of that gives us a definitive diagnosis of FIP, but it was felt really the only way to get a definitive diagnosis would be to remove the eye with uveitis, and that seemed to be a very aggressive and very um, radical approach. So based on her age, her breed, her general um, biochemistry, her acute phase protein elevation, and her coronavirus teta, we felt that that was strong enough evidence that she did have FRP, and we started her on GS441524 or remdesivir, um, and um, she responded well to therapy, she grew well, her uvi to settle down, and um, we measured um, her alpha-1 acid glycoprotein in, in our, with what the local referring practice did, and that showed that the alpha-1 acid glycoprotein had dropped quite significantly. This was a different assay with a different reference range, but it did show that along with resolution of the uvi there was a resolution of her systemic um, inflammation, 
and Wish is now 12 weeks out on her therapy. She's grown wonderfully and we're due to see her in the near future just to check to check the AGP is still low and that there are no, no other evidence that she's got grumbling um, FIP. So good place to use acute phase proteins, helps us not only with diagnosis, but also with following um, therapy. Now we have a therapy that seems effective in many cats with FIP. On the other end of the scale, we have Ebony, 17 year old domestic long hair cat, just presented underweight and inappetent, again, very common in particularly in elderly cats, but she had um, raised haptoglobin and alpha one acid glycoprotein, but her serum amyloid A was within reference interval. So she was one of the cats I showed you earlier um, on that table. Um, mildly raised urea and creatinine. But when we ultrasounded her, we saw some significant um, dilation of her renal pelvis, um, and there was generally increased debris in her urine. So when we cultured that, um, it was positive for E. coli, but given the whole picture, I was very suspicious that this cat had pyelonephritis. And that certainly impacts not only on your decision to treat a UTI, but what you use to treat and how long you might want to treat it. And she did respond well to a fairly prolonged course. She ended up, we had her on antibiotics for four weeks, um, potentiated amoxicillin because it was a broadly sensitive coliform. So that's all I wanted to talk about acute phase protein specifically. And I just wanted to, to use the last um, 30 minutes or so to talk about pancreatitis, not so much about the treatment, but about diagnosis and where acute phase proteins may, may be helpful to you in deciding um, in a patient who could have pancreatitis, whether that pancreatitis is relevant um, to the current presentation. So we'll look a little bit about diagnostics and talk a little bit about where acute phase proteins will help us. So probably over the last 15 or 20 years since we've had more specific biochemical tests for pancreatitis, we're certainly seeing an increasing number of cases diagnosed with pancreatitis. I'm not sure that necessarily um, equates to more pancreatitis. I think that may be that we're finding them. But I also find it's becoming a bit of a dumping ground in terms of people searching for a diagnosis, seeing a very mild increase in pancreatic lipase and then calling it pancreatitis. And that stays with the patient for the rest of their life um, without necessarily actually being the correct diagnosis. So um, the uh, sheep -a doodle I saw with a high CRP where we saw the serum protein electrophoresis that came in with a potential pancreatitis diagnosis with a pancreatic lipase at 271 which is in the equivocal range and that really doesn't seem to be the dog's diagnosis it seems to have much more inflammatory um, disease which at the moment we it looks like it's got bartonellosis so it's just important that we don't use pancreatitis as a convenient di diagnosis and then miss the underlying problem that the patient might have. We do know that chronic pancreatitis, particularly in cats, is very common. So up to two thirds of old cats at post-mortem have evidence of pancreatic inflammation. However, many of those have never shown any signs um, of pancreatitis in terms of their clinical history. We do see acute pancreatitis relatively rarely, and when it occurs, that's a serious and life-threatening disease. We sometimes see acute flare-ups of chronic pancreatitis, like the schnauzer we've seen, we, I presented earlier in the talk, um, where they have a predisposition, and if you upset the pancreas, then it will, the inflammation will flare. And we also see pancreatitis as a complication of many other diseases. So pancreatitis per se is not the primary issue but the underlying condition is so really the question that often faces us is is it genuinely pancreatitis and if it is pancreatitis is it active and is it relevant to the patient's current presentation 
There are a number of risk factors for pancreatitis, and I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, and you can, if you want to take that down as a list, then as Lisa said, this presentation is going to be available on the Hariba website, and you can take a screenshot. So there's quite a number of called potential risk factors, and risk factors are cumulative. So the more risk factors a patient has, so like previous pancreatitis, and then hyper tension um, and poor circulation of the pancreas, um, ischemia, pancreatic ischemia during anaesthetic, that will add up together and, and be a real trigger. I suspect, although we didn't really pursue it, that being a schnauzer it also had some hyperlipidemia, which again added to its risk of developing um, pancreatitis. We see um, two forms of acute pancreatitis, necrotizing and suppurative forms. Patients generally present acutely with severe signs, sometimes jaundice, collapse, weakness, hyperthermia. Interestingly for inflammatory disease and particularly in cats, when they have inflammatory disease, often that what you might consider to be a typical hyperthermia and associated with acute inflammation doesn't seem to occur. And they present actually with with low temperature. And this is an x-ray of a cat with um, stones in its pancreatic duct. There are non-specific biochemical changes that you may see um, in any sick patient, raised liver enzymes, hyperbilirubinemia, evidence of renal disease, evidence of electrolyte disturbances, inflammatory left shift. Just um, a quick word on amylase and lipase. It's still present in many of the um, panels that are run, diagnostic panels, but really the sensitivity and specificity of lip amylase and lipase is really low um, and it's less than 50%. So if you're using it as a diagnosis of pancreatitis, you would be more accurate by spinning a coin than you would be by measuring these two parameters. And, there are papers, for example, in cats showing that cats with high amylase are more likely not to have pancreatitis than they are to have pancreatitis. You can use TLI, trypsin light immunoreactivity. It's more specific than amylase and lipase, but it's not very sensitive. So it will only pick up a fairly small number of, of um, pancreatitis cases. So we, we're certainly using uh, pancreatic specific lipase or GGGR lipase for our diagnostics. And I'm trying to also hopefully convince you in this talk that adding in acute phase proteins may add to the richness of our diagnosis. But also, although it's acute and severe, and you think that pancreatic lipases should be elevated, there is quite a good literature to suggest that not all acute pancreatitis cases have raised pancreatic lipase. For most people, Imaging is going to be the modality of choice for making diagnosis. And whilst radiographs may have some value, may show lots of cirrhosal detail, some cases may show a, a mass, um, really ultrasound is, is where we should be. And it has reasonable sensitivity, but it's not perfect. So you can have dogs with acute pancreatitis where there is no obvious change in the pancreas on ultrasound. It's a really difficult diagnosis to make. And whilst we may think, well, we'll jump to advanced imaging. Neither CT nor MRI is that great. So sometimes we can really be left with um, struggling for a diagnosis. But again, this is where I feel that acute phase proteins can be very helpful in at least telling us that this patient has a really severe systemic inflammatory disease, which if combined with the risk factors that we know, breed predisposition, potentially with a positive pancreatic lipase or DGGR lipase, then I think that's it often enough to tell us that acute pancreatitis is likely. And although it doesn't necessarily change how we manage the patients, because we don't have any specific drugs to treat pancreatitis as per se, it certainly can help us with talking to the owners about the potential severity and outcome um, of that condition. It might prompt us to con consider whether it could be um, a bacterial abscess and, and whether antimicrobials um, will be helpful in this in those cases. <laughs>
So this was an acute pancreatitis in a cat. Come, the radiograph was helpful to the extent of clearly showing significant um, intestinal atony with a hugely gas-filled stomach. We can also see gas-filled colon. We can see gas in the small intestines and a marked loss of um, serosal detail suggesting a peritoneal effusion, which we'll also see in some pancreatitis cases. So there are a variety of described changes in the ultrasound in acute pancreatitis, um, and I'm not going to go through these specifically. Really, it's a matter, the most important thing for me when I see a case and I'm worried about whether pancreatitis is um, present is to make sure I know that I'm looking in the right paces. So being confident where the right limb of pancreas is along the duodenum and where the body is down by the stomach and where the left limb is in the mid abdomen um, associated or related to the um, portal vein. And if I see nothing in terms of uh, free fluid, in terms of hypochoic structures like this, in terms of mesenteric reaction, then I kind of assume, even if I don't feel I've actually seen the pancreas, that there isn't an, certainly a severe pancreatitis ongoing. So just wanted to talk you through a case. This was Portia, 11-year-old, female usually domestic short hair cat, marked weight loss, inappetence, polydipsia and weakness. And you can see she has a really dropped stance on both her carpi and on her hogs. She was depressed. She was in poor body condition. She used to be really quite a big cat. Um, she, her temperature um, was, um, I think there's, sorry, there's a typo there, that should say 36.1, so it was subnormal. Um, she was tacky, dehydrated, um, and her abdomen felt quite doughy on palpation. She had a high um, hematocrit, and a high red cell count suggesting dehydration, very mild neutrophil response, and her platelets were on the low side. We had a really significant increase in her um, TLI and in her PLI, consistent with um, pancreatitis, and you can see that lipase and amylase were within normal limits. This case did present before I had access to um, acute phase proteins, um, so that would have been useful, but we can also see that she had quite severe hyponatremia associated with her pancreatitis. And we could see this um, peritoneal effusion and of, um, a hypoechoic pancreas typical of some of the changes we'd see with pancreatitis. We seem to be doing quite well with her, um, but like many pancreatitis cases, um, she initially responded and then she got significantly worse because she had developed pleural effusion. She also developed a hemolytic anemia and then started to develop hemorrhagic diarrhea um, associated with, I think, a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So really, she's a bit of a case that just illustrates that pancreatitis, particularly acute, pancreatitis can be really tricky to manage. In some ways, I, I think if we'd had a good inflammatory marker for cats, that would have been very useful because I think we'd have found that although we appeared to have rehydrated her and corrected her electrolytes, her acute phase proteins would have been rising, showing we hadn't got on top of um, her inflammatory disease. Wanted to talk a little bit more about chronic pancreatitis because this is something that we're going to see far more commonly. As I mentioned at post-mortem studies, two in three cats have evidence that they've had pancreatitis at some point in their lives, despite a lack of history for many of them. And it's felt that cats are particularly at risk because they have this odd anatomic arrangement where the pancreatic duct meets the common bile duct before it ends up in the duodenum with a major duodenal papillae. And it's compounded in cats because they seem to have much higher levels of bacteria in their duodenum than dogs or people. And it's felt that they're much more at risk of ascending infection going into the pancreas or into the gallbladder. Um, so um, that may be why we see evidence in these 
post-mortem studies of a lot of cats having had at some point a, an episode of pancreatitis. In the majority of cases of pancreatitis in dogs or cats, we really don't know what, why they occurred. Obviously, we know something about the risk factors. We know that in dogs, there are a number of predisposed breeds. And so that might increase our index of suspicion because it's a predisposed breed. Um, there's some evidence, at least in the UK, that Burmese cats may be predisposed to pancreatitis. When we look at man, in man, then they're not a lot better off with than us. We, they certainly see a lot more um, cholidocoliths and, and pancreaticoliths as a cause and alcoholism. But when you strip out those causes, then they're left with a similar group of diseases that we have. And in humans with recurrent pancreatitis, many of them seem to fall in that idiopathic group, similar to, um, to our dogs and cats. Even some of the patients with acute pancreatitis, so some of those cases, um, you know, the dog that's eaten a whole load of sausages in the summer at the barbecue developed acute pancreatitis associated with really high fat intake. Although we might know that initiating cause and we'll manage that, often we it's very hard to predict when those cases will have flare-ups. They seem to be fairly random and trying to define those, um, those trigger factors is really difficult. And at least to some extent in dogs, we have the value of low fat diet that certainly seems to reduce frequency in cats there's no evidence the low fat diet actually reduces frequency and so i don't recommend that in cats it's also really hard to find a diet for a cat which is low fat because cats are very much less able to manage a carbohydrate digestion than dogs are so another case twiz um 10 year old male neuter bengal presented collapsed recent weight loss so she lost 1.2 kilos she used to be a really big bengal and you could feel a mass in her right craniodorsal abdomen when we ultrasound her she had these in the area of the pancreas she had these big um hypoechoic what appear to be fluid filled cystic structures in amongst some hyperechoic material and she looked like she had a granulomatous um, pyogranulomatous inflammation, so she did look like she had a suppurative um, pancreatitis um, as a cause of her weight loss, and she had a really storming pancreatic lipase, which also supported the fact that this was pancreatic tissue, although it was very difficult to be certain. It was in the right place where you'd expect to see the pancreas, and so without doing surgical biopsies, um, we weren't able to get much further, but she certainly did seem to to have that as a cause. And interestingly, um, TWIZ went on to develop diabetes, um, presumably because of the loss of functional pancreatic mass. And we can see the glucose um, that we had um, trying to control her diabetes. So what cases might we suspect with chronic pancreatitis? Well, so the middle-aged or older cats and dogs, often with vague signs, particularly inappetence, nausea, vomiting, weight loss. Um, it, the main thing, although in people, it's a fairly consistent finding that they have abdominal discomfort or pain, we often don't see that in our animals. And that's very hard to know whether genuinely it's less painful. I think it's more that these patients have learned to live with abdominal pain and they're very poorly reactive when you palpate them. Obviously, pancreatitis in cats can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease and cholangitis, so-called triaditis. And chronic pancreatitis, as in Twizy's case, led on to diabetes. In a few cases, they'll also develop exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So there are some things that can alert us to chronic pancreatitis in terms of signalment, in terms of risk factors, in terms of um, what we might see on ultrasound. Um, but in terms of diagnosis, then in many cases, we're looking at pancreatic specific lipase or DGDR lipase. You, if you see changes on ultrasound, 
in such as in TWIS, then finally LASPRIT can be a potential um, option to try and understand the pathology. But in order to make a definitive diagnosis, you probably will need pancreatic biopsy. But even in those cases, just biopsying the pancreas um, doesn't always give you a diagnosis. We've had cases, a number of cases now, where they've had pancreatic tissue in their intestinal wall, which is inflamed, whereas the actual main body of the pancreas is not inflamed. So their pancreatitis seems to be associated with the ectopic pancreatic tissue. Ultrasound changes are less obvious than in acute disease, um, and um, sensitivity is, is not so high. Some studies in cats with chronic pancreatitis showed that the sensitivity of ultrasound was, was really quite poor. Possibly as, um, as our ultrasound techniques have improved, as our high frequency probes have improved, that um, diagnosis or sensitivity has certainly improved. But the findings are often quite non-specific, as we mentioned, hyperechogenicity of the peripancreatic fat, a relatively hypoechoic pancreatic tissue, thickened pancreas. So they're not really signs of raging inflammation. They are relatively subtle signs that you'll find in um, the region of the pancreas. And it's not an easy organ to ultrasound, and you do need good quality equipment and um, a reasonable amount of experience. Um, but I still feel that you can get a lot of information just by being in the right area and very carefully in interrogating the area for evidence of peripancreatic fat change or free fluid. So some images of um, pancreatic change. So the pancreas here, um, the um, plicated duodenum, or um, which I often see in cases with um, pancreatitis. Um, again, pancreas here with the pancreatic duodenal vein looking somewhat tortuous. And some post um, some histological pictures showing evidence of fibrosis and inflammation. So this might be a fairly um, typical <coughs> picture of pancreatitis. We have the duodenum sitting here and the pancreas sitting below, and that 11 millimeters is is really quite thick for a, for a pancreas. So in the last few minutes, I just want to talk, come back round to sort of pancreatic specific lipase and the value that acute phase proteins might have in, in diagnosis. So I'm sure all of us are familiar with pancreatic lipase. Um, we can, it's a, a supposedly antibody that's specific for pancreatic lipase, not hepatic lipase or gastric lipase. Although I think there is a certain level of cross um, contam uh, cross reaction. And this is a typical SNAP test with a positive um, spot compared to the control. But we certainly do see false positives and false negatives with pancreatic specific lipase. But generally the SNAP test is quite good concordance with um, externally measured. Um, generally, sensitivities in chronic low-grade disease can be quite poor because the amount of pancreatic lipase is quite low. So there are two assays that are commonly used. There's a radioimmunoassay, um, which is probably um, the most accurate assay for um, pancreatic-specific lipase, um, but it takes more time, really is only a a, a, an external laboratory test, um, but as I say it probably gives the most reliability in terms of the presence of, of pancreatic lipase. More commonly um, is ELISA, that's both the SNAP test but also plate tests in laboratories where we've got bound antibody that um, binds the pancreatic lipase and then we have a, a color chromogen that changes when it binds to the, so it's a secondary antibody that binds the bound lipase on the primary antibody. We know that pancreatic lipase is not always sensitive nor specific. Um, the problem is we don't know how good it is because the definitive test for most cases would be pancreatic biopsy 
and that's a big step to take. So studies where they've tried to compare pancreatic lipase results with pancreatic biopsy have quite small numbers because most owners are, are unwilling to go to the point of pancreatic biopsy, and that's fully understandable because anesthesia is a risk factor for pancreatitis, biopsy is potentially a risk factor for pancreatitis. So you've got a patient that may already not be great, and then you're doing two things that could make its disease potentially worse. Because of that level of accuracy, there's often, the labs have sort of talked about gray zones in the pancreatic lipase measurement. So typically for feline pancreatic lipase, less than 3.5 is considered within reference, over 5.3 is considered abnormal. With the dogs, it's less than 200 within reference, over 400 abnormal. But although it is supposed to be specific to pancreatic lipase, we certainly see some patients with acute and chronic gastritis that can have quite significantly raised pancreatic lipase with no evidence of pancreatic disease. Um, and I also mentioned that we do see extra pancreatic, pancreatic tissue, which can lead to high pancreatic lipase. So if you get that patient that comes in that's vaguely unwell, um, where PLI is increased, but there's absolutely no other evidence clinically or from imaging to support pancreatitis, then I think you have to be really careful about making pancreatitis as your diagnosis. We do have a little bit of information about the accuracy of feline pancreatic lipase in terms of sensitivity and specificity compared to post-mortem studies. So these were cats that had FPRI measured before um, euthanasia and, and post-mortem. And you can see that the sensitivity and specificity is certainly not brilliant in this, um, for this um, parameter. And I just wanted to present you with one case that I did see. This was Ellie a young border collie. She had a four-day history of an absence of vomiting following an episode of scavenging. The referring practice measured her canine pancreatic lipase or externally. It was over a thousand micrograms per litre, so she was referred in as an acute pancreatitis. When we scanned her, we saw that she had this large apparent foreign body in her stomach. And when we scoped her, we found that she had <clears throat> a large raw potato in her stomach. Um, we weren't able to remove that, but we were able to mash it around enough that it did pass out of her stomach. And um, you could see when we were looking at this potato surrounding it that she had a diffuse gastritis associated with having a whole raw uncooked potato in her, in her stomach. But um, once that potato had passed, a week later, CPLI was 28 um, and um, the pancreas remained normal. So it would appear, at least in this case, that it was the gastritis that was causing a positive CPLI measurement rather than genuinely being a case of pancreatitis because getting that potato to move out of the stomach seemed to resolve um, both her clinical signs and um, uh, caused a marked drop in her canine pancreatic lipase. I expect a number of you, depending on which lab you use, will not will be seeing DGGR lipase in your profile. So this is another way of measuring um, li pancreatic lipase activity. So the lipase causes um, splitting of this molecule, and then you can measure that using colorimetric methods. It's um, can be performed both in-house, on in-house machines and externally. So this is hydrolyzed, GGGR is hydrolyzed by pancreatic lipase. And it's been reported to have good concordance with um, the pancreatic specific lipase antibody test um, and um, both in dogs and cats. So it does seem to be a, a reasonable test, although there is evidence that both um, hepatic lipase and lipoprotein lipase can also split DGGR. So it is a reasonable test. It's as reason it has good concordance with um, pancreatic specific lipase based on monoclonal antibodies. So um, 
I don't think um, it is necessarily helpful to run both these parameters. And I think if one of them is elevated, that's reasonable evidence that the other parameter would be elevated as well if should you choose to measure it. So just coming round as a full circle, chronic pancreatitis in my view is a really difficult disease to diagnose. And we see patients with chronically elevated levels of pancreatic lipase or GDGR lipase with no apparent clinical signs. And then they develop clinical signs and the pancreatic lipase level or the GGGR lipase level doesn't seem to change. So it's really hard to know how well those lipase measures are benchmarking. And this is where I feel that um, our acute phase protein are helpful. So if I see a patient which comes in with a potential diagnosis of pancreatitis being a cause of its unwellness, but its acute phase proteins are within reference interval, then that really <coughs> prompts me to look for another cause. And often we do find that there is another cause. So um, like the sheep doodle we discussed, um, the, the mildly elevated pancreatic lipase or equivocal pancreatic lipase didn't seem to be the primary cause of the disease. Whereas if pancreatic lipase is elevated, um, acute phase proteins are elevated, imaging is consistent and there are no other causes, no other obvious causes, then I think I feel more confident to call that a case of a flare up of pancreatitis and support it uh, appropriately. I think the danger is if you just look at that pancreatic lipase and say that's the cause and give them symptomatic and supportive treatment for pancreatitis, the risk is you miss the primary cause and therefore you end up um, perhaps not being able to treat the patient as effectively as you would like because you've not really got to that primary diagnosis. And obviously in cats, you may, if it's part of that triaditis type of um, disease group, then you may have gastrointestinal disease and potentially hepatobiliary disease as well, contributing to inflammation and also clinical signs. And just focusing on the pancreas may not again deliver you the best results for the patient. So I think that I've moved increasingly to using acute phase proteins where I suspect pancreatitis and seeing whether there's evidence of systemic inflammation, because I think for most cases of pancreatitis that come in um, significantly unwell, there needs to be a level of systemic inflammation for that really to be a diagnosis that I'm comfortable with. So in just in those last couple of minutes, just reflecting a little bit on what hopefully we've I've got across to you in the last hour and a half of talking. So acute phase proteins can be a very valuable adjunct in the diagnosis of inflammatory disease, and certainly it's more sensitive and, than, and probably more specific than the increase in white blood cells. So if you're relying on um, a leukocytosis for, as a diagnosis for inflammation, then you'll certainly be missing some patients with systemic inflammation. I think it's a very good discriminator for that vaguely unwell patient to try and decide on whether you wait and whether you worry, so how quickly you pursue your investigation. I think it does have some value in tracking response to therapy. So like Little Wish, um, the fact that the uveitis resolved, that could just reflect the fact that the uveitis had resolved, but she still had systemic inflammation. But the fact the AGP had fallen down to reference interval gives you a certain degree of comfort that the systemic information is also under control. But we still have a lot to learn about acute phase proteins in cats. Are there specific acute phase proteins we need to use for particular diseases? Or do we just need a better understanding of a single acute phase protein, such as serum amyloid A, that will tell us when we are faced with a cat with systemic inflammation, and particularly because cats do present with chronic disease in a very non-specific way, that quiet, lethargic, inappetence like weight loss cat, which could be anything from relatively mild to 
potentially quite severe disease, having a way of discriminating those cats quickly is extreme, would be extremely useful. Just reflecting on pancreatitis, so common chronic pancreatitis, much more common than acute disease, but the clinical presentation of chronic disease can be very vague. So pinning it down as a diagnosis is difficult, and that's compounded by the fact that we don't have an easy gold standard test on which we can benchmark pancreatitis apart from biopsy. And even then, occasionally biopsy will lead us astray. We can use ultrasound, but it's not of itself particularly specific and sensitive. And there's also a relatively poor correlation between cases where ultrasound said there was pancreatitis um, and when pancreatic lipase or GGR lipase um, said it was um, pancreatitis. So if pancreatic lipase is raised, is this associated with um, active disease? That's one question. And is that pancreatitis primary cause of the signs or secondary to another disease? So do we have a more widespread inflammatory disease, which is just including the pancreas? And if we only focus on the pancreas, then we're going to miss that bigger picture. And in that respect, I think acute phase proteins can be very helpful in determining if systemic inflammation is present. And that helps us with managing where we might want to go with these cases. Just a final point when I, before I finish, there is some confusion in the literature, and you may have picked it up when I've been trying to search for terms for pancreatic lipase. So some people would call pancreatic specific lipase the same as DGDR lipase, and then we'll use CPLI or FPLI for the antibody based test, which is looking to um, bind pancreatic lipase. It's, it's a confusing literature and in, when you read papers you just need to be quite careful that you understand what they mean, particularly if they say pancreatic specific lipase. Are they meaning the antibody test or are they meaning DGGR lipase? So final case, this is Charlie Burton um, who was a dog with chronic inflammatory disease for all sorts of reasons. He had um, inflammatory um, bowel disease, he had at bouts of pneumonia and he was a case where it was useful tracking his c reactive protein to know when he came in not doing so quite so well whether this was a relatively minor problem um, for which time would be a good place to to sit and see if he got better or whether it really was a more acute problem um, where he needed more active intervention so just finally, before we go on to questions, I'd like to thank Hariba for allowing me to speak about a subject for which I really have some great passion and interest in because I think it really helps me with the way I manage my medical cases. I'd also like to thank my colleagues for referring cases that we I've been able to present today, um, other colleagues for giving me support and advice, and some for supplying some of the images that I show. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for listening both those people who are listening to this live webinar, but also for people who will pick it up off the Hariba website. So that's um, everything from me, and I think it's time um, for questions if you have any. Absolutely, thank you so much, Kit, for your really, really comprehensive talk. Uh, we've covered an awful lot of ground there, um, and once more, a really engaging uh, presentation from you. I've heard Kit speak a number of times on a, on a number of subjects, um, quite diverse, uh, and his knowledge is always uh, uh, delivered in such a helpful way and with your, your experience. And I know that you've, you've explained before we started this evening, you're actually still at work right now. <laughs> so after what I'm sure has already been quite a long day, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, as Kit's mentioned, we are very, very happy to take uh, questions now that, that Kit will answer or if there are any uh, questions that the Hariba team can help you with, please pop them into the, the questions chat on your screen. Uh, we, will, we will manage that. So feel free to, to put any questions in uh, in a written form just now and we'll pass those over. Uh, so just to reiterate, you know, we've really benefited from, from Kit's experience. Uh, he's touched on the use of in-house laboratory equipment and also reference labs as well. You know, if you have kit um, 
I meant lab kits, not Kit Sturgis in, in your practice. Um, then you'll obviously get your answers super quickly, or there's the, the option of sending out to the lab, and I think most of them will have a courier service where you can get your, your responses quickly. Uh, and of course, it's my job to say to you that, yes, Hariba um, do supply the equipment that, that's been mentioned. So we have haematology equipment, we have um, clinical chemistry analyzers, uh, and also launching very soon, we have um, acute phase protein and immunoassay immuno analyzers coming. So if you have any interest in those, you'll be able to see our contact details on the screen. Um, so feel free to get in touch if you'd like any more information uh, about any pieces of equipment uh, with, with no obligation from us. Um, so we've had a, a question come in so far. Uh, this is from Sarah. So she says, hello Kit, how are you doing? So I think she may be uh, an acquaintance. Uh, and she's asked, what is the time lag for increased pancreatic lipase in an acute setting? Um, very good question, Sarah, for which I don't think we have a very good answer um, because uh, we know that in the first few hours, first 24 hours, certainly of acute pancreatitis, pancreatic lipase may not be increased, but exactly when you can be confident to say, if it's 48 hours past the start of an event and the pancreatic lipase is still normal, that it's not pancreatitis, I, I don't think that's possible. And there are actually some cases where there's good strong evidence of an acute pancreatitis that of some duration where pancreatic lipase has not increased as you would expect. So unfortunately, with any single test, there, there are always limitations. So whether you're talking about pancreatic lipase or whether you're talking about CRP or serum amyloid A, it's not always going to give you the answer. So it's trying to fit it into that puzzle, that overall picture of clinical signs, history, imaging, whether it all fits together or not. Okay, thank you. And I, I think you've stressed the point, Kit, of having a look at, at, at the whole picture. So not just looking at, at the bloods, taking your, your imaging into account uh, and the, the appearance of the animal and, and the signalment. We know these cases can be um, complex to diagnose. You know, Munchie was a particularly good example of a, an animal that had quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, so looking at the whole picture and, and everything that that brings with it is so key to, uh, to ensuring your success. Um, we haven't had any of the questions come in so far, but there are a couple certainly that I've had following uh, the presentation. You mentioned um, around uh, pre-analytical factors, so things like your, your haptoglobin, um, if you've got hemolyzed sample, that's going to affect your results. Um, are there any other things that we need to look out for when it comes to sample quality and, uh, and effects that they might have on, on outcomes? So, um, obviously, good sample quality is important. The more hemolyzed or lipemic or um, a sample is, the more commonly assays struggle, and that probably affects um, Labo in house laboratories more because they use colorimetric methods. So anything that's going to affect the color can affect the, the assay to a greater extent than some of the external labs where they use wet chemistries. So I guess the, the key feature for me is to get as clean a sample as you can. I'm a fan of making sure that you separate samples. So although uh, you can, for a number of machines, use whole blood, and some of them genuinely are better with whole blood, and some of them, I think, like your 24-parameter biochemistry machine, they you put whole blood in, but it then spins down, so it then uses the um, heparinized plasma. So it tends to give you a, a cleaner result. Um, in terms of CRP, it seems quite a robust parameter in most measurement systems, um, and so hemolysis does not seem to be a major issue that I've encountered in, in measuring it. Okay, that's great, thank you. We, we know that, yeah, good, good sample quality in and, and better results out, so thank you for, for clarifying that for us. Uh, and, and, and I suppose with that, sorry Lisa, just the, okay. the one thing I often run into as problems is I people send me in a blood result and it's not clear whether the patient has been adequately starved prior to um, 
that that blood being taken and obviously if you've got an acutely sick patient that, that comes to the practice you're going to blood sample it there and then you're not going to wait for a 12-hour starve in a sick patient but it's really important to make sure you record somewhere whether this was a genuinely starved sample or whether it was taken because it needed to be taken but actually the animal had eaten three or four hours beforehand and certainly in sick patients generally they can often have a level of um, gastrointestinal ileus so sometimes even if they've eaten quite some time before they still have substantial amounts of food in their gastrointestinal tract which might impact on a number of your parameters particularly sort of urea and, and cholesterol and triglycerides so just try and remember that make sure before you leap into making a diagnostic interpretation of the test that you you're clear on whether they how starved they genuinely are Okay, that, that's a really good point. And I think there's probably a difference there in the, the referral cases and, and the first opinion cases as well. Uh, you know, if you're getting a referral case with a, a, a really good history, it might be different to a first opinion case where it can be a little bit more hit and miss uh, what the owner may have seen or not seen, you know, immediately prior to presentation. And I guess as well, you know, with the, the having been starved or not, um, you get some indication there of what may have happened, but also whether they've eaten or not, but what they might have eaten as well. So you touched on the the, the patient that may have eaten the, the whole tray of sausages at the barbecue or similar, which will have quite a different effect to something that, that hasn't been eating for the last few days. Um, so so thanks for the clarity on that. Yeah. Uh, another question that's come in from, from Cleo. Thank you, Cleo. Um, and again, if you have any, any particular cases that you have uh, an interest in, um, we touched on the staff pets earlier on. They're always good ones for, for throwing up a few, uh, a few anomalies. Uh, so Cleo's asked, uh, is there any prognostic value to how elevated CRP is in very sick cases? Uh, we have it in our in-house uh, slash emergency critical care clinic, but still figuring out how to make the most of it. So the, the work that's been done suggests that it doesn't, confer prognosis so it tells us about the extent of the inflammation but it doesn't tell us how bad that inflammation necessarily is so i i suppose if i see a crp of 25 or 30 then it probably means that the inflammation is relatively low grade but that patient could have severe neoplasia, which isn't that inflammatory. So it doesn't make it a good result. It just makes it that inflammation is not a really huge driver. In some cases, if I see a, a stiff, painful dog with a really high CRP, I'm actually feeling a little bit happier because for me that often associates with immune-mediated polyarthritis. And those patients often do quite well, despite the fact they have stormingly high um, CRP. It can so for me it's that that pressure to investigate rather than prognosis. So I would be reluctant to use it as a single measurement for prognosis, but I do feel it has value in terms of if I'm then made my diagnosis and have the patient being treated like Munchie, how is that CRP changing? Am I getting that inflammation under control? And if I am, then that probably does support um, a better outlook than a patient that's really inflamed. And obviously, um, as I'm sure we're all aware, the inflamed patient has real risks of things like thrombosis. And for many of our critical patients, I think the cause of death usually comes down to that systemic inflammatory response syndrome and real abnormalities in clotting factors. And again, that's one of the things that I really like to have. If I'm doing critical patients, then having ability to measure clotting in-house can really help you with understanding where your patient is, is sitting. And although, you know, there are great, you can send them out, it, it's a problem when you're not going to get an answer. For, even if you've got courier systems, you're still not going to get an answer for nearly 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That may be a point at which um, the patient has you know, has really deteriorated. So um, I think there is real value in, in having that right combination 
of in-house tests that can really help you when you're faced with that sick patient and you really have to make the best decisions you can as quickly as you can make them. Okay, Kit, thank you for the, the clarification on that. I think one thing perhaps to also ask then if you are taking um, serial CRP measurements in your sick dog, uh, what's your recommendation around the, the interval for the monitoring CRP? Yeah, that, that really good question. I mean, I guess because of the half-life, it's going to halve every 24 to 36 hours. So um, then we, um, so I, I definitely, I, I see very little value in measuring more than once daily because I don't think it's going to give you in, enough information. And like any parameter, you've got to accept that there's probably a 10 to 15% variability just in-house assay and external assays too. They just do tend to vary from sample to sample. If you try and sample too frequently, you get small change and it's really hard then to decide is that just laboratory variability or is that genuine evidence of improvement or deterioration. So the reason I'm at work tonight is because we've had this acute kidney injury in a post anaesthetic patient and that patient's CRP is about 30 and I am concerned that this might be developing pancreatitis um, because the, the, the conditions that have led to poor renal perfusion will probably have led to poor pancreatic perfusion. So 29 is not terrible and there are probably quite a few ways we could understand why that is. The dog has had a little bit of surgery in its eyes so that may be accounting for it. But tomorrow the real thing for me is has that CRP increased which would make me more concerned um, about the possibility of pancreatitis. It does have some um, plication of its duodenum already and therefore I would be more worried if the CRP is falling down from 29 then I'll be much more relaxed that it's probably with fairly non-specific associated with the surgery and anaesthetic and things. Okay, well, that, thanks for that. It's really interesting to have a live case going on as we speak, and we certainly wish wish your patient all the very best. We can certainly tell that that they're in very good hands with you. Thank um, you. So, so more questions coming in. Uh, another one from Sarah: um, Is CRP affected by drugs, e.g., uh, NSAIDs? So, um, probably not NSAIDs. It will be affected by um, use of steroids. So um, that does make interpretation more complicated and it's not a simple answer because as I mentioned in the talk, one of the drivers for the production of acute phase proteins are cortisol because that's an, cortisol is a stress hormone so when you've got the disease. So in the short term, it might lead to a, a mild increase but obviously then if prednisolone is damping the inflammatory response then CRP is going to fall and then your question is, is the inflammation genuinely being resolved or is it just being held down by my steroids? And that may be where these high sensitivity CRP assays can start to help us because they might be able to tell us how well we're doing and therefore when we might want to back off our prednisolone. But non-steroidals, because they're not acting um, through interleukin-6, don't tend to have, in my experience, don't tend to have a big impact on my CRP measurement. So some of the RMPAs we see have come in on non steroidals because they've been stiff and painful, and that hasn't seemed to have made a big difference to the CRP measurements we've obtained, as far as I can tell. Okay, that's great. And uh, that's led us beautifully on to our next question, which is, uh, I have a case of IMPA at the moment. Uh, can I use CRP to potentially taper the steroid dose more quickly than the standard every three to four weeks? So potentially, but um, the sort of standard CRP, the, the lower limit of, of sensitivity of the test can be a bit of a problem. So for many of the tests, once it gets below 10, it's just below 10. And it's probably in that area where the variability occurs in terms of should I decrease prednisolone or not? Um, the little case of Maisie, uh, which 
had a CRP of about seven, she was fine. If it got up to 10 or 11, she started to show signs again. So it, it may help you in the beginning to tell you that your prednisolone is being effective. And I guess if I was 10 to 14 days into managing an IMPA case and my CRP was still really high, then that would be something that would probably drive me to thinking about using a second immunosuppressive agent. But I don't think that the routine CRP case has enough sensitivity to really yet use it for deciding when to reduce therapy. But if we can get a high sensitivity CRP, just talking to Hariba here, well, they might like to think about that, then I think that really could be helpful um, because I think it could make a real difference to some of these patients where much shorter courses of steroid may actually be entirely effective for them. And for those other patients where they really need long-term steroids and if we stop them too quickly, then they flare and then they're more difficult to control again, that would be really helpful to us. Okay, thank you. And we, we've duly noted your, your comment there. I think perhaps with when you're using the um, ELISA type tests, obviously the sensitivity is, is much less than them and, and other, other tests are available, but it's handy to know that in respect of what people have access to in their clinics um, and can use day to day uh, and also what you may get with using an external lab as well. So we, we don't want to take away anything from the external labs. Uh, we've, we've been quite heavy on the dogs on the questions, if anybody's got a, a cat question, and then please feel free to send that in. Um, we haven't had anything else so far. I'm just looking at my own notes to check if there's anything else that, um, that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, I did just want to also thank you for sharing your brand new research with us as well. Um, so your, your comparison table there, looking at the different inflammatory markers. Obviously, you're in a position to be able to monitor those very, very carefully. It's interesting to see how different disease processes uh, might affect different inflammatory markers. Um, so it would be uh, helpful for us to know how that looks going forward, you know, how, how your work um, develops with that. And maybe if we, we touch on this again in the future, then you'll be able to update us. But uh, it's very, very helpful to know that those different things can make a difference in diagnosis. Yes, and, and I think it Cats are crying out for a good inflammatory marker that we we understand as well as CRP. <clears throat> and I worry that because CRP is available and seems to work quite nicely in dogs, cats will just get left behind. And so maybe there, there are areas that we need to look at. And, and I was quite concerned about in that particular piece of research, I really didn't seem to get the serum amyloid A to work in cats. And I don't know, went to an external lab who used um, who felt the serum amyloid A assay picked up cat serum amyloid A, but I wasn't entirely convinced. So just for, for clarity, that was just a piece of looking at that panel. And it may be that the serum amyloid A I was using was really not the best assay for, for use in cats and that we may, there may be better assays out there that would have given a lot richer data and i'm still searching for that so um it would be great if we could get one to work because i think it, it would make that difference to those cats that just present not very well and we're trying to decide what to do next for them okay well, that's really helpful to know and, and quite fair of you to say as well uh, um you know a, a really timely reminder that that not all assays are the same and you did touch on in the talk as well kit that um you know if you're going to start with a testing process to continue along the same route you know so don't necessarily think that your crp from your reference lab is going to be using exactly the same methodology or the same reference range as your in-house instrument so starting on a, a, a testing route a path um, that we, our understanding is that it's important to to continue along that same path or if you are using different um, methods or different supplies then to, um, to to take that into consideration when reviewing your results absolutely and and i think that really is a very important point so if you if you are using your in-house then carry on using it and equally with all my in-house machines, periodically I send some duplicate samples out just to check and see how they are going. And 
it really helps if you have a member of staff who regularly who who, who looks at all the results so we have <clears throat> the in-house machine we have at optivet for some reason every now and again its sodium goes wrong and suddenly it'll pop up some high sodiums and if you're not focusing that can be a sort of that can lead you down a, a completely wrong path because it just seems to be a machine error and i'm not quite sure what happens with our system but it seems to happen quite regularly but having somebody who will suddenly notice that the last three biochemistries have all come up with a high sodium alert the practice to say actually this might be a bit off so don't pay too much attention to it um I had one again today talking about our little acute kidney injury case where we ran a blood gas and it was trying to tell me its sodium was 180 and when which is vastly above the reference range and, and would be really serious um but we ran it on a different machine and it came out at 145 we ran it again on the blood gas machine and that said 148 so I feel it's really important that before you make a really big clinical decision based on one abnormal test, just tr just reflect a bit on was I expecting this result, and particularly if I wasn't expecting this result, could it be that the machine was having a bad day? And all machines have bad days. We probably don't see those when it happens at an external lab because they will have rerun the sample and they will have tweaked the machine. So the thing they report to you is not necessarily always the first result they've got. So it can make external labs appear more or more correct all the time. And, and I don't think that's the case. They they have better quality control because they're batch running samples. They've got controls in each one they run. But you need to have, be in your own lab, in your practice, you need to be the person, or you need to have a person that just looks occasionally at things and things. You know, we've been getting a lot of un unexpected results, and maybe that is an issue with the machine. Most machines, if you read the manual, will talk to you about cleaning them and, <laughs> and servicing them. My experience when people are in very busy practice running lots of samples is that's something that tends to go by the wayside. But it is really important if you're going to rely on your results because dirty machines, particularly when they're using colorimetric methods, can really impact your results. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's something that's very close to our heart at Hariba as well. And we, we did also touch on, on sample quality as well. So all of those things uh, come together to, to give the clinician the, the best possible chance at an accurate diagnosis. So good sample quality uh, and quality control and quality assurance are things that are very close to our hearts. And certainly if your practice um, is a member of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons practice standards scheme, uh, you'll be expected to be performing some QC or QA checks on your instruments. Um, we work a lot also with human laboratories as well, so reference labs. And the requirements, certainly for human reference labs and for accredited veterinary reference laboratories, are incredibly stringent. The amount of um, controls and checks and balances that they have to carry out are, are really significant. So, uh, as Kit says, you know, your reference lab, the results may not always be perfect, and there are always, you know, there's always the potential for instrument failures. Um, however, um, QA and QC procedures uh, we cannot recommend them highly enough you know we, we do trust very much in our instruments but occasional are the use of quality control material um, sending out to your reference lab the same sample and having a look at the results they may not be identical but they should be broadly similar um, so carrying out some kind of uh, a check or a process uh, and as we said earlier as well just does this look like the, the picture you know your, your blood gas example is a really good one and, and best of three maybe <laughs> with that one today um, was, was what got you there in the end. So uh, that, that's a whole other, um, that could be a whole webinar on itself on, on QA and QC procedures, uh, but it's something that, so that is very important. Um, if you have a, a lab tech or a lab manager, um, I'm sure they'll, they'll be um, across that and, and it'll be part of their job, but it's something that we do need to ensure that the practices uh, and labs are looking at as well.
Um, we are drawing to a, a close now, so if you have any questions, anything we haven't covered yet, any burning issues, um, please do put them into the, the chat on the screen there. Um, but also, you have our, our contact details on the screen. If you're watching back, uh, or if there's anything that springs to mind after the webinar is finished, uh, you have email addresses and mobile numbers there. Um, also, you have the Hariba web address and our social media. So this has been, uh, the, we're in our third year of doing these webinars now. Uh, we've had a range of different subjects across uh, small animal, large animal, um, a different range of disciplines. Obviously, you've had our word from the sponsors, uh, but we do always use key opinion leaders, key opinion leader speakers um, who, who talk, as Kit has done today, in an area where they're an expert and they have a real passion. Um, so if you do have a subject that you would like us to, to do our next webinars on, uh, please feel free to, to let us know. Obviously, your engagement is very important to us, uh, so, uh, so keep us in the loop. Uh, and I would also just like to thank the Hariba team who are working behind the scenes who put this together this evening. Uh, we're all, uh, all working after a long day, so, so thanks to everybody that's been involved. Uh, I haven't had any more questions come in, with that, that will help to, to draw us to a close. Uh, so anybody who's attending uh, the events on screen later this year, Hariba will be attending those. We will be at others as well. Uh, but if you'd like to come and see us on the stand, then please do. We'll have the uh, equipment on display. So we are obviously, as we've mentioned, um, covering haematology, uh, clinical chemistry. Uh, we're launching soon a, a new blood gas instrument. We also have coagulation, which is something that Kit, Kit touched on earlier too. Uh, so come and say hi if you're at uh, BSABA, at BVA. BVA, maybe we won't see you at the equine show, but London Vet Show will certainly be there as well. Um, Kit, was there anything else you wanted to add before we close today? Only to say that obviously if, if you, um, in reflection in your shower tomorrow morning or tonight, think of a question, then if you ping them to, to Lisa or the Hariba team, um, then they'll send them on to me and I'll reply and we'll get back to you on with an answer as, or as good an answer I can come up with so um, <laughs> sometimes it takes a little bit of time for all the information to sink in and so we're happy to support questions that occur to you um, later on absolutely yeah yeah and you've always been very helpful Kit you know there are occasionally questions that we have that you you're happy to help us out with uh, but you have seen our, our contact details there or if you are to search for uh, Hariba Veterinary, uh, you'll find our website and there's an inquiry form on the website as well. So if you either in the shower, over breakfast, when you have that next really interesting case come up, whether it's a staff pet or a, or a, a patient that's come in from one of your clients, uh, you don't be afraid to ask a question if something comes up afterwards or if you're watching back. Um, so I, I think that's us for this evening then. So after, after a long day, I'd like to thank Kit once more for his, uh, his very comprehensive talk, for sharing his knowledge with us. Uh, and to everybody who's attended, thank you for, for joining us. And we hope to see you at another Hariba webinar or at one of our uh, Congress attendances soon. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye.